Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. <clears throat> this was, as so many of these projects are, a vastly multidisciplinary project, drawing on a wide range of different expertise from a wide range of different institutions. We know that we're in this biodiversity crisis at the moment in the UK and across the world. There's a vision for this to be changed, for us to become more nature positive, and that's internationally, but that's also expressed um, by agencies such as DEFRA through the 25-year environment plan that DEFRA have and other agencies within the UK to bend this curve of biodiversity loss through conservation, through nature restoration. And all of that is really beneficial to us in terms of the benefits that we get from nature in terms of well-being, but also in terms of ecosystem services. So all of that is well known. Um, but that requires good decisions to be made. And one of the things that we found out through DECIDE, as we engaged with a wide range of stakeholders, is that many of them, although, although we do have good information on biodiversity, actually many of them lack this comprehensive and fine scale information about where biodiversity is and how the interventions are changing and improving biodiversity. So that was one of the key findings, one of the drivers um, from the DECIDE project. Secondly, we have thousands, tens of thousands of volunteers in the UK going out collecting biodiversity data through citizen science. And this citizen science is a crucial part of our environmental monitoring. It complements the data from professionals, from on the ground sensors, and also from remote sensing. And citizen science is really well evidenced in terms of the impact it has on national trends in biodiversity, as shown there for butterflies, a uh, lot of state of nature reporting, where we've been able to report on the state of um, nearly 10,000 different species across the UK. Being involved in recording wildlife in this way also benefits people and it supports action for nature. So it's all positive. But when you actually look at the data, the data are often, well, not often, they are gappy, both locally, as shown there on the map, but also nationally. So many more records from the south of England than there are from the highlands of Scotland. And this creates a real challenge because it means that we're limited in the data that we have but volunteers are actually really motivated. This is a finding that we, we came to from the DECIDE project. They're motivated to actually record in the places where they can most make a difference. So it leads on to this um, uh, mantra, I suppose, for the project, that all records are valuable, but we don't simply need more biodiversity records. We need more informative records. And that's what we sought to do across the DECIDE project. And so with this, we took the example of butterflies and moths as key bioindicators for the state of the environment. As I said, we worked in a really it's interdisciplinary way. You can see the institutions represented there, drawing on not just ecological science, but also statistical science, um, data and computing science, visual data analytics, um, the social science and, and working with a wide range or working with several different um, stakeholders, practitioners who are on the ground. And so dealing with these really large data sets of 18 million species records from a wide range of different observers, volunteers who've gone out and made these records, we were able to construct models during the DECIDE project. And the thing is, is that um, what made a, a step change in terms of what we were doing was we were doing it at finer scales. So at the hectare scale rather than the one kilometre scale. And these models came with um, uncertainty. And so the, one of the other key things about the DECIDE project is that we then looped this back. And so the recorders were informed about where they should make records in order to best fill these gaps, in order to make records which are most informative for the needs of decision makers. So closing this loop back for the benefits of both the volunteers and their motivations and also the benefits of those decision makers. 
And so some of the outputs from the project were this Decide tool, which was an interactive tool whereby recorders could go on, they could click on their location and see the places where we most needed records. And, and that sounds really simple and straightforward, but this was actually developed with a really rich and intensive process of co-design with those recorders, thinking about how to make this tool beneficial for the science so that we could optimize the recording there, but also so that it was relevant, so it was appealing and it was actionable for the volunteers. You can see that this was updated in real time from some of the recording platforms that we've got. We're talking internationally with other partners about how we can take this forward, because clearly this is a benefit to the UK, but we're actually relatively data rich in terms of biodiversity records in the UK. So how can we take this to other parts of the world and, and roll this out to really make a difference in our biodiversity information systems? We also thought more and more about the feedback that we give to these recorders and how we can use data pipelines to provide personalised, bespoke feedback to the individuals about the impact of their recording and looking at how motivating that that is. So we did that within a, a sub-project within this. And we're actually rolling this out further with um, funding through the uh, Natural Capital Ecosystem Assessment um, and embedding it into some of the practices that we um, have within the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and the Biological Records Centre there. We also explored these new sensor networks, low-cost sensors for moth recording, and you can see one of them on the table at the back. One of the key scientific results that we got from our studies and the simulations that we did was this targeting is clearly going to be appealing to some recorders some of the time. And actually what we found was just one in a hundred, if one in a hundred visits are targeted, it makes a difference to these species distribution models. And that's really heartening. Small amounts of intelligently targeted interventions in terms of this citizen science makes a difference to the biodiversity model outputs. And in terms of those uses, we engaged with a range of different stakeholders from agencies and NGOs to co-develop this proof of concept tool, showing or providing these uh, maps of biodiversity information and, and biodiversity richness. Now, these were challenging to produce and, and there were issues with them which we're seeking to resolve, in particular through collaboration with the Alan Turing Institute to improve these models, including exploring using AI. So there's some really um, interesting directions in which we can take this further. And finally, um, Ron referred to this. We, the whole question about nature becoming digital raises a whole load of questions, which are really important. They go beyond the science. And so we've got a film um, in the area where the, the drinks are being served which explores this really, or which demonstrates this really beautiful art-science collaboration that we developed during the course of this project. Um, what would data tell us if it could dream? And so do watch the film, have a look at that. Um, and this, this was a really, it wasn't simply communicating what we learned, but using the arts embedded within this project was part of the research itself. So thank you very much.